Greetings, living ancestors, and welcome to Codex Compliant. Let's talk squats. The squats were essentially fantasy dwarves, but in space. Which is pretty much just what a lot of early 40k was, taking fantasy elements and making a sci-fi version of them, sometimes with a funny name. However, squats are notable since they were a whole army prominently featured in the first edition of the game that just kind of disappeared, and never had a dedicated codex of their own once such things started to appear in second edition, which is why we've only mentioned them in passing in this series up till now. There's no single book to review. Despite that, there was one particular thing that we wanted to cover, so let's take a look at the closest thing to a codex the squats ever got. Inside White Dwarf 111 from March of 1989, there was a great many wonders of the age contained therein, such as Rick Priestley in a bolt thrower t-shirt and an advert for Steve Jackson's fist. It's a, a, fo a phone thing, it's not weird. Okay, it is maybe a little bit weird. But what we're concerned about here is the article Warhammer 40,000 Squats, Space Dwarf Warriors and Mercenaries by Brian Ansell, Nigel Stillman and Graham Davis. This article is 22 pages long, if you count the catalogue page of models at the end, putting it in the lower end of the page counts if it were a 3rd edition mini codex. Longer than an Assassin's, but not quite as long as Craftworld Eldar. So while the Squats never did get a codex, and this would be short even by the standards of the already quite short 3rd edition ones, and codexes didn't even exist in 1989, this was as close to one as we were going to get unless GW brings them back as a full army. Which, although not impossible, is very unlikely. The article contained all the lore and rules you need to run a squat army in 1st edition 40k, or even a chaos squad army if you're nasty. It's where a lot of what we know about them comes from, so let's go through it and see what rich veins of lore are found therein. <laughs> Do you get it? Cause, cause lore sounds, sounds like awe and the, and the squats are minors. F*** you, I'm funny! Now this, this isn't relevant to anything really, but in the 30 or so years that this book's been around, it seems to have picked up a very interesting aroma. It's like the underside of a hot bus seat. To summarise the lore presented here, squats are abhumans, like ogrins or ratlings. Or to put it another way, they're humans who have evolved to suit their environment. In this case, they were originally human colonists on high gravity but mineral rich worlds, hence their short but hardy physique. Their history is split into five ages, the Age of Founding, the Age of Isolation, the Age of Trade, the Age of Wars and the Age of Rediscovery. The Age of Founding was the period in which humans started forming mining colonies that would eventually become the Squat Homeworlds. This was roughly around the year 20,000. The Age of Isolation was analogous with the Imperium's Age of Strife, where the galaxy was beset by warp storms, cutting off the Squat Homeworlds from the rest of humanity, leading to many of the unique quirks of Squat society to form. Next was the Age of Trade, which was the few thousand years after the warp storms began to abate, where the Squats traded their mineral wealth with the Orcs and the Eldar. To this day, the Squat hydroponic plants developed with Eldar help are among the most efficient food sources in the Imperium. However, these relationships collapsed when the Orc warlord Grunhag the Flayer attempted a full-scale invasion of these Squat homeworlds, and the Eldar ignored their pleas for help. Thus began the Age of Wars, which was, as the name suggests, not a calm and peaceful time for the Squats, and to this day they bear a grudge against the Orcs and Eldar. The final age, the Age of Rediscovery, represents the time from the Squats making contact with the Imperium up until now. Well, when I say now, I mean around the year 40,000, and when I say around the year 40,000, I mean around the year 40,000 as represented in late 80s 40k, you know what I mean. Once rediscovered, the Squat Homeworlds retained a remarkable amount of autonomy from the Imperium proper, providing troops, trade and technology to the Imperium, but able to entirely govern their own internal affairs and even maintaining their own religion. Although they do integrate elements of the Imperial cult when around other Imperial forces. Cause, you know, the Imperium doesn't like it when it's not all about them. Squat society itself is based on strongholds, autonomous communities ruled by a lord and their aristocratic class, the Hearthguard. Strongholds join together to form leagues, some only made up of a handful of strongholds, and some being huge and encompassing thousands of them like the Capellan League. Within a stronghold, each squat has an obligation to military service. However, tradition requires that they raise two sons to maturity before they join, so as not to risk diminishing their population with the endless wars of the far future. 
Also, the Hearthguard provide an elite core to their military, making them a very rare example of an aristocracy that is actually vaguely useful for something. Nobody said sci-fi ever had to be realistic. Another interesting part of their society are living ancestors. You see, squats usually live to be around 300 years old. However, a small percentage are able to live to be over 800. At around 500 years old, though, these living ancestors begin to gain psychic powers, the strength of which they draw from the dead ancestors of the clan, and so their power is governed by the prestige and honour of those ancestors. Living ancestors are the basis of squat religion, which takes the form of ancestor worship and are the most trusted and respected advisors to the Lord. The final part of Squat society to mention is the Engineers Guild. The Squats developed a remarkable proficiency with tech, and retained a lot of things from the Dark Age of Technology that the wider Imperium didn't. All this gave rise to the Engineers Guild, who are the most skilled in working with all this fancy tech. They're much less rigidly structured than the rest of Squat society, and come and go between strongholds as they please. These Engineers are held in high regard, but are fiercely independent and like to travel light, so, how did GW choose to represent this? By making them space bikers with mirrored shades and their tummy poking out. It's a choice. This was also back when space marines were... Well, they were written to be a little more overtly fascist, so they consider all abhumans like the squats to be tainted and genetically impure, so the administratum tends not to post squat troops where they might encounter marines. Although, saying that, there is a quote from Lehman Russ showing that the intense dislike was not entirely universal. Do not underestimate the squats. They survived for millennia, cut off from the Imperium and are sealed from all sides. The determination and resilience is an example to all. Another thing we've noticed when reading through this is that although it talks about raising children, it only ever talks about squat men, so we're just going to assume that the squats in here work on Discworld Dwarf rules where they all use male pronouns due to reasons. It's either that or the writers just forgot to mention about half the population whilst describing a civilization, Which would be embarrassing, although not exactly uncommon for a sci-fi or fantasy race. For those interested, by 2nd edition's Codex Imperialis, several parts of this lore had already been moved around a bit. For example, the squats trading with the Eldar and subsequent bitterness to them is excised. I mean, they aren't exactly fans of them or anything, but their dislike of the Eldar is in a more general, grumpy, dwarven way. However, the orc trading and betrayal remains, even if Grunhag the Flayer's attack now seems to be unrelated to it because that happened around the 39th millennium and not pre-Imperial discovery. So yeah, to summarise, being born on a squat homeworld wouldn't be the worst place in 40k to be born on. That, I mean, that's not saying much, considering the state of a lot of Imperial planets, but could do much worse. So, let's move on to the actual units you can take. And if you're wondering how a basic squat in here lined up with a basic human stat line from Rogue Trader, they're a little slower in movement and initiative, but make up for it by being tougher, having a better weapon skill, and generally better psychology-related stats. First up is the Warlord, which is different to the Stronghold's Lord, for reasons, and his Hearthguard Bodyguard. These were usually the leaders of your force, were decked out in elaborate equipment, and moved around as one unit. They're also one of the few units that could be fielded in the squat equivalent of Terminator armor, Exo armor. A thing we've previously compared to a grimdark version of the Yoke Folk from the Dizzy series on account of that being exactly what they look like. You'd think it'd be too bulky to allow them to buy the trike upgrade while wearing it, but no, there was nothing stopping them. Rogue Trader was a wild time, kids. Next up were the Combat Squads and Brotherhood Weapons Teams. Combat Squads were your basic squat line troops, and although their default weapon was a las gun, they could be equipped in multiple ways, including all troopers dual-wielding las pistols, or even all having heavy bolters. Weapons teams were just a couple of little guys with a big gun of some sort, like a mole mortar, tarantula, or rapier. Then there were the guild units. First up there was the guild master, basically the guild equivalent of the warlord, and as such was the other unit to have access to exo armor. Then there were the guild weapons teams and guild bike squads. These were all mounted on bikes or trikes, and could zip around the table hurling a wide variety of range damage upon their enemies. Actually, here's a fun little thing. The heavy weapon trike teams could perform skid turns to quickly turn and face the gunner to the enemy and allow for a quick escape. There's even a cute little template included so that you could perform this. You could put a bunch of different things on those trikes too, from mundane stuff like autocannons, all the way up to conversion beamers. 
Next was the living ancestors, who were slower and weaker than regular squats, but tough as all hell, and the psychic powers they had access to were mostly defensive in nature. You could also pop him in a sidecar attached to one of the bikes in your army, which was adorable, and also shows off the modular nature of those bike models. They also had access to some regular Imperial stuff, like Rhinos and Land Raiders, because pretty much everyone in Rogue Trader did, there weren't exactly many vehicle kits to go around, along with a bunch of Imperial robots. They could also have up to 1,000 points of off-table artillery in case you didn't really want to use miniatures in this miniature war game. Finally, there were a couple of regular human units you could take, namely Commissars and Tech Priests. These were along in a purely advisory capacity, and so the Commissar wouldn't go about shooting any of the squat troops for disobedience. You know, out of politeness, and presumably the knowledge that they'd be shot right back. Also, the art in here is pretty fun. I know the squat is supposed to be pointing something out to him, but they all just look like they're posing for a photograph. However, there is another squat force with rules in here. Squats that have fallen to the ruinous powers of chaos. Trader squats used the same army list as their non-chaotic counterparts, but suffered some stat penalties. However, they were able to roll for chaos attributes and rewards from the Realm of Chaos books, as well as benefit from some of the weaponry from there. So if you wanted a space dwarf with bird feet, then this was the army for you. Also, Chaos Space Marines had no issue allying with Trader Squats, showing that sometimes the blood-soaked Gene Forge lunatic running towards you screaming blood for the blood god can often be more reasonable than your standard Imperial Marine. As a fun little touch, they mentioned that although many of the Trader Squats come from those that sided with Horus during the Heresy, some are rumoured to be from the homeworlds that were swallowed up by warp storms during the Age of Isolation giving you ample excuse to get really wild with the Chaos Mutations, limited only by your patience and the depth of your bits box. Although not strictly speaking part of the squat rules, there is a thing at the end of the article we want to mention. If you've watched a lot of our videos on old 40k and thought to yourself, it sure seems like there were a lot of things added in articles during Rogue Trader that must have been a real pain to keep track of. Well, at the end of the article, there was a list of everything added to 40k beyond the main rulebook in the roughly year and a half since it was released. And yeah, it was a lot. Almost makes me want to stop complaining about the quick turnaround of rulebooks in the modern game. You know, almost. The Transformers will return after these messages. Hey you! Yes, you! Do you require clothing to cover up your sinful flesh? Me neither, but should you desire it, Snipe and Whip shirts are now available along with other baubles and trinkets covered in references that you'll have endless joy explaining to your friends and family. Just follow the link in the description to the Snipe and Whip merchandise store, just like all of these highly intelligent and financially responsible adults. We look forward to hearing from you soon. So yeah, this was as close as we ever got to Codex Squats. But what happened to them after this? Well, they'd continue to knock around for the rest of 1st edition and were alongside the other factions at the dawn of 2nd. However, they'd never receive a codex of their own despite codex squats being mentioned by name in the 2nd edition Imperial Guard one. By 3rd edition, they'd pretty much vanished and had also disappeared from 40k's sister game, Epic, during its own 3rd edition. Although admittedly there were 3rd edition epic rules for them printed in the Citadel Journal in 1997, later reprinted in an issue of Firepower in 1998. The story goes that the canon reason for their departure was that the squat homeworlds were eaten by Tyranids, but the reality, like so many things we talk about in this series, is a little bit messier. The Tyranid story seems to have first reared its head in late 1999 when a fan wrote into the US version of White Dwarf to express his displeasure at the removal of squats and received this response in issue 240. Would you believe they were all eaten by the Tyranid invasion? Or, due to the Squat's biker lifestyle, every one of them was arrested for disturbing the peace and sacrifice to the Emperor. Where do you think they get all those souls anyway? All kidding aside, it doesn't seem likely the Squats will ever again see the light of day. When they were out, they never seemed very popular, showed up at our stores or tournaments, and didn't sell on top of all that. Their look was really outdated compared to the hundreds of other great Warhammer 40,000 models. Don't send us hate mail, it's just the cold hard facts of the 41st millennium. Now, the Tyranid thing is presented as a joke, on the same level as they were all eaten by the Emperor because they couldn't stop doing wheelies in front of the Custodes. But this became accepted as true by many people. Then, in the 2004 reissue of the Inquisition War Trilogy... Oh, you silly thing! What are you doing on the floor? 
That's not where you belong. Then in the 2004 reissue of the Inquisition War Trilogy, it contained a new introduction by Ian Watson where he states his sadness that the squats had all been eaten by Tyranids. There was also a line referencing the squats demise added to the start of the first book of the trilogy, but considering its vagueness and the fact that the novel Draco is very non-canon, it doesn't really mean a great deal. Which all suggests that despite there being no hard lore explicitly saying so, that the they were all eaten by Tyranids explanation was the company line. Something backed up by a 2004 post on the GW Specialist Games forum by Jervis Johnson himself. Or at least someone claiming to be Jervis, it's kind of hard to verify now, but people believe in its authenticity and that's good enough for this kind of thing I suppose. It's far too long to read in full, but it basically states that the lack of sales wasn't the reason for the squat's removal. In fact, they sold just fine. It was mostly due to the fact that they couldn't really figure out what to do with them, and had regretted many of the things they had done with them. From the name of the race, squats, what were we thinking, through to the short bikers motif, we've managed to turn what was a proud and noble race in Warhammer and the other literary forms where the archetype exists, into a joke race in 40k. He states that they should have removed them from the game sooner, and reinforces the idea that as far as GW was concerned, they were indeed eaten by nids. We decided that we write the squats out of the background by saying that their home worlds have been devoured by a Tyranid hive fleet. This would leave the door open for them to reinvent the space dwarf idea with the Demiurge. Demiurge? 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 Ugh. An alien race connected to the Tau that showed up in Battlefleet Gothic, but sadly never really developed past that. So, the squats were eaten by nids, but it also didn't really say it anywhere officially or seriously, but it's also probably 100% true. Sort of. As we said, messy. However, to this day, whenever GW retcons something out of the game, some people refer to the thing as being squatted, in reference to the squats removal. Of course, these days GW seems a little less ashamed of the squats, and has had a few mentions creep in here and there, along with some models for Necromunda. And that's probably a good place for them, as fun little things that make for neat oddities for new players and put a big old smile on the faces of older players. But hey, if GW ever wants to bring back squats as a full race, then, well, we ain't gonna complain. For now, they'll just remain an interesting oddity, an artifact of an era of the game where a faction's leaders could all look like militarized kinder eggs and that was just fine. Thank you very much for watching our nonsense. Big thanks to Zoran the Bear, Longfang, and Arbiter Ian, who lent us their voices for this. Links to all their stuff is in the description. And hey, if this video tickled your fancy, then the like button is right there. As is the subscribe button. Just saying. Also want to say thank you to all of the names going by right now, who not only allow us to pay rent, but also allow us to buy issues of magazine from 1989. If you'd like to join those names, just head over to patreon.com slash snipe and wib and pledge as little as a dollar. You'll also see these videos early and get access to some silly Patreon exclusive stuff. Oh, also we have t-shirts now, but um, you all saw the ad, so you don't, I don't need to tell you that again. Um, okay, I'm done with this call to action bit. Uh, you can go back to listening to the Commodore 64 music now. Mm -hmm.